So welcome to SwiftConf as well from our side. Um, we're talking today about animations mainly. Uh, before we start, we want to introduce ourselves quickly. The person on my left here is Amos. He's an iOS developer advocate uh, at Stream. He switched into developer relations from design, so he really knows what he's talking about. Uh, you can find him on Twitter, and he also has many GitHub repos that he contributes to, so all of them are definitely worth checking out. And I'm Stefan. I'm a developer experience engineer at Stream. Uh, I like to tweet, blog, and do many other things. I'm also interested in other technologies, such as the web, machine learning, AR, and more. You can also find me on Twitter and check the website there. Uh, as uh, or was already said, we're here from Stream, and Stream is one of the sponsors here. So um, in case anybody here has not heard of Stream, then one, we have done a bad job, because it's basically our job that you heard of us. Uh, but I want to give a quick introduction. So we're a free in-app messaging SDK. Uh, we provide UI kits for both Swift UI and UI kit, uh, and also many other platforms, so Flutter, Android, the web, even some gaming platforms, such as Unity. So we're basically on all the platforms. And what's cool is that our claim is that you can integrate chat in your apps in days instead of months, as, would, as it would take if you would do it yourself, maybe. And how this works is that we offer some high-level UI components. You can integrate them, and you can customize them, and brand them just as you like. Uh, and we do the heavy lifting in the back end. You don't have to take care of this. And you can get started for free. We have a 30-day trial, which is nice to try out. And we're also hiring. So if you're interested, then you can go to our website. But that's enough for the, for the marketing piece of it. So the real question is, why are we here, like the both of us, right? And the reason is that we really like animations. Uh, they are always nice. But also, sometimes, there's quite a few bad ones. And we'll also talk about that. But our goal is to show you some best practices that you can use in your applications uh, and make your apps better with animations and not worse. We will show you a lot of examples here. And we'll also discuss why they're either good or bad. So our goal is to make you able to build great animations yourself. right? Uh, so we'll talk about how to build them. Uh, and the examples are using Swift UI, but all of the principles that we're talking about are also applicable to other platforms as well. So it's also possible to use that on Android and web and everything else. We will talk quite a bit about how things move and how they should move. So there's quite a few things to consider there. And we'll also go into more advanced concepts such as timing, easing, and pacing. And you will learn what that means later on. But before we start, really, we have a quick disclaimer, because this talk will not feature any code, right? And this is not because we're lazy and we don't want to share that, but we just think it's not perfect for this stage to show code. So we decided to create a GitHub repo, which is open source, that you can look at afterwards, with all the samples that you see in the presentation. Like all the samples are rebuilt using Swift UI, and you can all check them out. You can play around with them, explore them, learn from them, and of course steal them if you like. But to set the tone a little bit, right? Our goal is that uh, you see this kind of animation here, and you see this bell icon here, a little bit awkwardly animating. And if your users see something like this, they might not really be happy, right? So our goal is to show you how to, you can transform something like this into a good animation. So this looks way more natural, right? And not only will you be proud because you've built something nice like this, but your users will also be very happy. Right? But when starting with animations, the first question you should always ask yourself is why, right? So why do I need this anyways? And we'll have a look now at a few animations a few examples that we really liked. And we'll talk about two things there. The first is the meaning of the animation, and also the purpose, right? Because they should always serve a certain purpose. If they don't, then you shouldn't use them. 
And the first example is taken from the Duolingo app. Uh, maybe some of you know it, right? It's the, the lovely owl that's greeting you in the onboarding process there. And what this does is it directly adds some delight and some playfulness to the application. And this fits really well with the branding that Duolingo offers. So they want to make learning a language fun, right? And this is perfect for that, right? That you greet it with this nice owl that's also part of the logo and will accompany you throughout the app. So it's a very nice example of just a nice animation that's just fun to see. The next example is something different, right? You can see this menu here, and it's called a hamburger menu. And when the person clicks on this, it will transform to a close button. And what this does is it communicates a state change. Right? So before, this button served a different purpose. It was there to open the menu. Right? And while the user clicks on that, the attention of him or her is right there. So switching this up to make it a close button directly communicates, hey, this has a different meaning and a different purpose for that. The next few examples are taken from Apple's apps. So the first one you can see here, it's taken from the App Store. Uh, and I'm a little standing over here. So what this does is it guides you through the process of installing an app. Right. You need to conform and confirm uh, that you want to really install it. And the nice thing here is that this little bounce of the white rectangle here directs the attention to the user from the user directly to where it needs to be. So it guides them through the process and directs them to the next step they need to take, which shows also a very nice functionality. And in the same realm is this uh, slide to power of animation that probably all of you have seen as well, right? What's really nice about this one is it doesn't only draw the attention of the user to where it needs to be, but it's also guiding them through the process, right? If you look at this shimmering effect, it's going from left to right, and that's exactly the action the user needs to perform. So they need to swipe their finger from left to right to achieve what's needed. That's also a great example there. And speaking of guiding the user, this is the Register registration of the face ID process. And what this very subtle, gentle animation in the middle of the, with the face does is it also it, it guides the users through the process, right? When face ID was new, nobody knew how to use it. And with this subtle animation, users were guided through the process. And with the rectangles, uh, the green ones are in the circle, they were also getting straight confirmation of uh, that they successfully performed the action. Another great example of animations is the weather app. Right? Uh, you can see these beautiful, very natural animations here. And I mean, it makes sense, right? Weather is pretty natural, I would argue. But what's also cool is that they're really realistic. So you have a look at the app, and you directly see how the weather is right now. So you, at first glance, get a direct feedback of, hey, this is what I need to know about. Which makes it also really credible, because you directly know what's going on. And you can go into more detail when reading the text, but it's cool that on first glance you directly get the information you probably need. The next example is taken from one of our apps uh, at Stream. And you might have guessed it's a long screen animation. And what this does is it gives, gives the users some feedback what's going on, right? So we're loading. I mean, you could also not have this, right? And just show an empty screen. But the cool thing here is that users will know, hey, something's going on, right? I just have to wait for a little bit more and also add some nice branding, right? With, the, with our logo just bouncing up and down. And the same principle can be applied or is, is the, the background of typing indicators in chat, right? So if you look at this, there's this very subtle animation of these circles animating. And this again, it gives the users feedback, hey, something's about to happen, right? There will be a new message. So it hints them that, hey, new content is coming soon. Probably many of you know this Twitter-like animation. And what, what's really nice about this is it augments the feeling that you should get when actually liking something, right? You appreciate that the person shared something, 
probably a helpful tip for you or something else. Uh, but it really uh, accentuates this feeling of gratitude. And speaking of gratitude, um, we have also the, the medium clap animation here, right? It does the same thing. So it, you click on it and it encourages you to express that feeling that you want to give because you really appreciate what someone has shared with you, right? So expressing gratitude can also be something at some purpose of an animation. Again, uh, the Duolingo app has some very nice examples here. And if you complete a lesson there and you continue on your learning process, you get greeted with this uh, success lesson complete screen. And what this does, it, it motivates you, right? I want to see this screen again. I want to complete more lessons. So a very nice approach to uh, drag users back in and motivate them to continue on with their journey. This is also a pretty common animation that's used. Uh, so in general, button animations can have a lot of purposes and a lot of meanings. But what this does is it's really inviting the user to act, right? Because if there's something going on with this button, so maybe you should be interested in clicking it. This can also be a dark pattern, so it can also try to force people to maybe uh, claim a subscription or something. But if used right, this can also be a very powerful thing. And as also another invitation to act can be a very subtle animation like this, right? You see this thing slightly uh, animating up and it's indicating that, hey, you can scroll in this direction. So there's more content there, right? That otherwise maybe users would not have found. The last sets of examples I want to show you. The first one is the Siri animation, right? We've all seen this. And what it does is it indicates that, hey, there's something going on in the background, right? This uh, Siri is working hard to, uh, to get your query right, and it always does, right? So in the end, this will be very successful, and we, we will get a nice answer from Siri. Another example for this representation of activities is for taken from a dictation app. So this button has this very subtle animation that hey, something's recording, right? Because you wouldn't need this technically, but it gives a nice confirmation to your user that, all right, it worked, right? Because it would be pretty frustrating if someone wants to record something and in the end realizes, hey, I forgot to click the button. So it's a good confirmation for them as well. All right, now you've learned about good examples. But of course, what's more fun is bad examples. Right? And I want to preface this by saying these are all taken from real applications or websites, but we won't mention any names, of course, where we got them from. But uh, yeah, they are really uh, realistic and taken from the real world. So the first one is this screen. And this is actually probably the animation that actually got our idea for this talk. So we were ordering food together, and we were seeing the screen, and we were waiting for our order to confirm, right? And we were waiting, waiting quite some time. Because this spinner, it's just rotating forever, right? And we were sitting there like wondering, okay, so when is it gonna be ready? And we were wondering. And actually it wasn't, like this was the final confirmation step that everything worked, right? You should do this. That's not a good idea. Right? And even in our Slack channel afterwards, uh, people were having the same problem. Right? People were saying, oh, it seems I'm having an issue. The order got stuck. Uh, and OK, something didn't work. My pizza wasn't added. But like the worst thing happened, right? the person who made the order actually got it twice. Right? So only because this animation was added there and this spinner was added People were confused and they were actually ordering twice, which is like the worst thing that can happen because if you think about it, if the spinner was not there, everything would have been clear, right? The text was pretty clear, but only through the animation, people were really wondering. Another example is this slider. This is a little bit more subtle, but if you look at it, it has this halo animation animating up, right? And if you think about the real purpose of this slider is to set a certain value, right? But what this 
halo and this pulsating animation does, it's really distracting you, right? It gets in the middle of what you want to do because your attention is drawn back to this circle that's not really important because you want to know what value you just set, right? So this is an example of hijacking the user's attention to her own place, right? They don't need it there. They want to see what value they're setting. So again, you shouldn't do this. It's not a good idea. The next one you already saw, right? This animation, it has a nice idea to animate this bell, but it's just, it doesn't look natural, right? So it's clearly using the wrong parameters. Again, you shouldn't do this, but we have a suggestion for you what you can do better. If you look at this, we can see that it animates around the center, like the anchor point of the animation is the center of this icon, and that's not a good idea. So if you change this up and put the anchor point of the animation to the top here and add some springiness to it, this animation looks way better. And it looks way more natural than actually like a bell would really behave. Right? So when you use the right parameters, we agree with this. It's a good animation. You can use this. The next one is this thing sliding in from the top and then leaving to the left. But why? I mean, it's coming in from the top, right? So it doesn't make any sense that it's leaving somewhere else. This doesn't really feel natural, and it's actually pretty disoriented. So again, don't do this. But luckily, there's an easy fix for this, right? You can just make it come in from the top and leave to the top again, right? With this, this looks way better, way more natural. And we agree that this can be used. Next. There's this really fun effect called marching ends, where you animate the path of a certain property and a certain object. And while this can look really good, if you look at it, it doesn't really look right. So it's really springy, and this doesn't naturally fit in right. So spring animations can be really cool, and we'll learn about more of them later on, and when to use them. But if you overuse them, that's not a good idea. What's better in this case is a linear animation, right? It's these uh, ends are now marching linearly, and everything looks nice. So if you use the right easing here, and in this case it's a linear one, then we agree that this looks good, and this can definitely be used. OK, now we've learned about some bad examples. <coughs> and now I want to hand it over to Amos to talk about how to do it right. So, having great animations can embellish your apps, but to be able to create great animations requires you to know some animation principles. We have so many different kinds of animation principles. But in this talk, let's look at key and the few animation principles you can adapt to create great animations. In this example, we have a card that transitions into full screen mode. But looking at this animation, you can see there is a subtle animation that happens before the actual or primary animation. We call this anticipation. So you can, give, you can use anticipation to give users a sense of what is about to happen. We took this example from the App Store. If you go to the today's view, you can tap on the card. And before it expands to full screen mode, it scales down slightly which is the anticipation. So you can use anticipation for creating photo zoom effect. For example, you have a photo that needs to transition from thumbnail state to full screen mode. When you see this screen, the one thing you focus on <coughs> is the number changing randomly from zero to a final value. This is called staging. You can use the principle of staging to direct users' attention to focus on what is really important on a particular screen. So you can use it for animating countdown and count up timers. Staging is great because if I have a number that animates from 0 to 1 insta to 100 instantly, it is easy to miss what exactly happened. But changing the animation gradually 
it allows the user to see how the number change, change from the initial state onto the final state. Next, we have this example. We have a chat bubble. So using a long press gesture to tap on the chat bubble shows a spring animation that overshoots the reaction icons. We call this follow through using spring animation. Spring animation uses the principle of physics to create soft and imprecise motion. So you can use it to overshoot the resting state of an object. We have it in so many apps and games. If you take a look at Telegram, we have it everywhere. It is present in iMessage. We also have it in Streams Swift UI sample app. In this example, dragging the text makes the individual letters behave as if they have a loose connection with the primary motion. This is called overlapping action. So we can use it to create, ca to create cascading effect. If you have similar elements animating in the same way, we can use overlapping action to offset the begin time of the individual elements to create a cascading effect. This is great because it makes the individual elements animating behave as if they have a loose connection with the primary motion. Now, let's move on to the real world. In the physical world, when objects move, they do accelerate and decelerate. So in the digital world, we can mimic this acceleration and deceleration. We can use springs and easings to mimic acceleration and deceleration. Springs are used for modeling momentum and friction, but they don't depend on time, so they are very difficult to work with. So most of the animations you will create for your iOS apps will involve using easings. We have so many kinds of easings, but let's look at the standard easings that are present in core animation, starting with linear. In this example, we have an object that animates from an initial position to final position. But looking at this animation closely, you can see the object is undergoing a constant speed. So the constant speed makes this animation look unnatural, and it looks very mechanical. So do you need to ignore the easing for linear completely? The answer here is no, because it has its own space in the animations landscape. You can use linear for creating rotational animations. We took this example from Yahoo Weather and recreated it with SwiftUI. As you can see, the objects are rotating with constant speed. So if you need to create any animation that requires the object to move with constant velocity, you can use linear easing. Another example is this matching ants effect. We are using it to move the open path along the hat icon. So we can change this animation to use any other kind of easing function, but that will make this animation look really odd. So linear makes sense in this context. There are more application areas for linear. You can use it to create time-lapse animation, animate opacity or color changes. Let's move on to ease in. In this animation, you can see the object is starting slowly and ends rapidly at the top. So you can use ease in to create auto-initiated animations. For example, moving objects from one from the screen to one edge of the screen. But we also recommend you not to use ease in to create animation that involve opacity and scale, because it will make the animation end suddenly. One application area to use ease in is to use for objects that requires no attention. This object requires no attention because it is just disappearing from the screen. So if you have an object 
that moves away from the screen, the best easing to use is to use ease in. Let's look at ease out. In this animation, the object's motion starts rapidly and towards the end, it slows down to create a damping effect. So as the object moves, its velocity decreases over time. You can use ease out to move objects onto the screen and it is perfect for creating human-initiated interactions. For example, in this case, we are using it to animate an object that requires attention. It requires attention because it is moving towards the screen. We have a lot of application areas where you can use this out. It can be used for creating button tabs and page-to-page -page interactions. Next, we have is in out. With is in out, it makes the animation start slowly. Towards the middle, it will just increase in acceleration. And towards the end, it will make the object slow down. So comparing this to real life, that is how most objects move. Let's take a look at the movement of a car. When you move a car, it will start slowly to attain a high speed and when it needs to come to rest, it needs to slow down again. So you can use is in out to create on-screen motion. For example, if you have an object that moves from one end to another end called to and fro movement. In this example, we are using it to animate both rotation and scale transform. So both objects needs to animate right on the screen. So using is in out is perfect in this context. This is also another example. We are using is in out to animate rotation and scale. And since the object is animating right on the screen, this is a perfect easing. Next, we have default. Using default, the object starts rapidly to attain high speed and towards the end, it will slow down. So this is similar to ease in out, but the only difference between ease in out and default is that with ease in out, the object starts slowly and increases its speed in the middle. With default, the object starts rapidly to attain high speed and reduce its movement towards the end. So like ease in out, you can use it to create system animations. For example, if you want your animation to mimic system animations like I, those on iOS, watchOS, or tvOS, you can use it to create on-screen animations. In this example, we are using it to animate the number and also the circle because both objects are animating right on the screen. Most of the time, the standard easings may not be what you are looking for. Luckily, we have custom timing curves in core animation. <coughs> timing curves use mathematical expressions to define how objects move with acceleration and deceleration. So if you want your animation to have a unique look and feel, that means you can use any of the custom timing curves. We have several of them, but we have categorized them into four main categories and under each category we also have different examples let's begin with sinusoidal looking at this graph you can see it is similar to easing out it makes the car start slowly towards the middle it increases its speed and towards the end it slows down so you can use it to create gentle animations like easing out next we have circular most of the time, you want your animation to have dramatic acceleration. In this case, you can use circular easing. We also have exponential. This will make the object move fast. And then, if you want to create gen uh, energetic and exaggerated animation, this easing is the best you have to use. Next, we have special effects. 
and one of the easing that falls into this category is ease-in outback. This is a combination of ease-in and ease-out. But looking at the graph closely, you can see the start and the end goes beyond the uh, starting positions of ease-in and ease-out. So you can use this to create animations for um, photo zoom. For example, you have an image that transitions from a gallery into full screen mode. You can use this easing to create something like um, anticipation, like the App Store card we showed previously. So I have shown a lot of standard easings and custom ones. So how do we preview and visualize these easings before we use them for our iOS animations? Shamefully, we don't have any tool to do that. Shamelessly, we have MotionScape. Using MotionScape, you can create and prototype with different kinds of easings before you commit to use a particular easing function. So you can think of it as the best way to visualize easings and copy the code for your SwiftUI animation. Let's move on to timing. This is another parameter you need to adopt to create great and good looking animations. Timing is how long the animation should take. And pacing is also the speed at which objects animate. Combining these two parameters, you can easily differentiate great animations from a very terrible one. So when creating animation, you should bear in mind not to make it so slowly or run faster than they should. So how long should this animation be? Anytime you create animation, you may just be wondering. In this case, you need to create something like duration sets to have different speed for each animation. You can have immediate, fast, slow, and intentional for the animation. Now, let's look at another parameter that will make your animation great. Mass and weight. Mass is the same as the weight of the object. You can use mass to overshoot the object. So what it does is it changes the inertia of the object. Inertia is the tendency of the object to remain in its state of rest or uniform motion. Simply, it is the willingness of the object to move. And when it is already in motion, it is its willingness to stop moving. So using it, you can just overshoot the resting state of an object. Let's look at an example. Here, we are using mass to simulate both lightness and heaviness. You can make an object heavy by increasing its mass to a larger value. If you do so, it will make the object very difficult to move because it has a higher mass. And when you reduce the mass, you make it lighter. And that makes the object faster to move. And when it is already in motion, it will be very easy to slow it down or stop it completely. Back to you, Stefan. Thank you. So I was lying. That was the only slide we had with code on it. But I hope, I hope you excuse that. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about some best practices, right? So now you know the principles of animations, how they work, and what parameters you can set. So let's talk a little bit about best practices that you can take home with you. So we talk about four things here. And the first thing is that animations should always be nimble and precise. So what that means is, effectively, they should actually convey the information they have in a more effective way than it would without be without them, right? Saying that means that it should not keep users really waiting longer than they should, right? And maybe you remember that one example there, Lotus, they should not, not really run forever, right? We saw it all in the food delivery example there. The next best practice is that you should always follow basic accessibility guidelines. So basic things like screen flashing, right? Very excessive animations. Then they can cause headaches and seizures to people who are receptive to that. 
And the other end of the spectrum, if you have very slow animations, they might make your app feel frozen or sluggish. So that's also not something you really want to do. In the end, it's just important to know that excessive motion can really cause discomfort or dizziness for people. Uh, and examples for that uh, are parallax animations and sliding animations. But now you might be wondering, like, if people are receptive to that, so what can we do? Right? And I'm glad you asked, because there's the reduced motion parameter we can use in iOS and all the other Apple platforms. What it does is it's a system setting for people to turn off animations and motion effects completely. And how this works is basically if there's these sliding and zooming animations, they are simply replaced by the system to use dissolve effects, which is just an animation of the opacity of an object. And these mentioned parallax effects and also the wallpaper animations, for example, they are completely disabled when users have this setting on. And luckily, it's very, very easy to use this because, at least in SwiftUI, you have the environment variable called accessibility reduce motion. And with that, you can easily respond if a user has set this. And you definitely should. And there's some great examples, uh, especially on Apple's own apps, that does this. So we saw the weather app earlier, right, with the nice weather animation. If people have actually the, uh, activated the reduced motion setting, these animations are not there. So they are disabled, right? Because people might be receptive to it. Another example is the iOS Messages app. And they have this very nice full screen message effects that you can send, right? You can send lasers and everything. But when the setting is on, they won't autoplay. They won't play. Them. So this is another example of a setting where you just respect what the users need. And you can even go the extra mile and put it into your own settings, right? You can create a setting screen for users to turn on or off animations and other effects if they desire to do so. And one app that's worth mentioning is pCalc, because in their app, they actually do this. They have an option in their settings to turn off animations, and especially the scaling effects. And if you look at this, we see button clicks there have this slight scaling animation that you can see when you click a button. But in their settings, they have an option to turn that off. What this does is will only very slightly animate the opacity, so it will directly respect what the users want. The last best practice we want to give you is that using system components gives you a lot of things for free. Right? They already include motion. So if you look at, for example, tab bars, if you click on different tabs there, it will animate them. And also if you navigate in the view hierarchy, it will navigate between the different screens automatically. Another benefit of this is that people are really already familiar with this user experience. Right? They will feel right at home, and they are used to do the same things in the system apps as well. However, it's perfectly fine if you want to create your own motion system and your own components there. There's just a few things you should probably keep in mind. And one is to not overwhelm your users. Don't create too fancy patterns that people need to learn and don't make them uh, regret downloading here. What's also important there is that you should always keep your users oriented, right? It's always important that they always know where they are and that they never lose focus there. And the last thing is that feedback to users' actions is really, really important, right? When somebody clicks somewhere and something's happening, they should always get feedback of what's happening. All right, so to recap some of the most important principles that we learned today. First, accessibility. You should follow the basic accessibility guidelines. There's no excuse, basically, to not do this. And we'll have some other nice talks about accessibility tomorrow, so we're all looking forward to that. Uh, and, and one easy thing you can do is you can use the reduced motion parameter, right? This will turn off animations, and if you respect that, there's also some work you've done. Animations, again, they should be nimble and precise, so they should help convey information more effectively and not keep users waiting for longer than they should. It's always important to define a clear goal and a clear purpose of the animation that you want to perform. And we have a few questions and things you could think about. So the first thing is, does it provide any useful information? If not, then just don't do it. It's not necessary to do. 
does it convey any emotional response? Right? Should it be motivating? Should it be expressing gratitude or something? We saw the cascading text animation, and this was a clear example of an animation that is, is establishing a clear relationship between different elements on the screen. Right? The different characters there were clearly connected. Again, you should always respect the reduced motion setting. It's also fine if you make your things feel springy and bouncy, because frankly it's just fun to do that, right? But you should always be careful with it, because you can also go overboard. So always keep in mind that you use the right easings for the right animations. And lastly, it's not really recommended to add very custom and excessive transitions and motion effects to interactions that happen very frequently. Because if you think about it, if someone is using your app and is performing an action like 30 times a day, and it's taken a five second animation for it, they will get frustrated. And they probably won't use the app anymore. So if it's one message that we can give you today, then we think it's always important that you should think before you animate. it. And if you want to go somewhere else from here, we already mentioned we have this nice GitHub repo uh, which is called Purposeful iOS Animations. And we will share this on the social channels so uh, you can see that there. It's also linked in the presentation which we also uploaded to Speaker Deck. So you can have a look at that. Feel free to play around and if there's anything you can always reach out and ask us. There's also some nice other repositories to check out. The Motionscape app that you saw earlier is also open source. You can have a look at the source code as well. We also used some other references. It's always a good practice to check out at least the human interface guidelines. You can learn a lot from just reading them. But also the other ones were things that really uh, helped us creating this talk. So if you want to get the slides, you can either get them here, or you can check that out later on the social channels. Wait, wait. <laughs> Did everyone snap a picture? <laughs> yes. Um, all right, then all for us to say is thank you for listening. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it, and if there's any questions, I think we have time for that, right? So, thank you for your insights about animations. Do we have any questions?
question because you mentioned about my favorite topic, accessibility. Did you thought someday how to represent animation in voiceover? Did you make some research about that? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's a very interesting topic, and it was mentioned on WWDC regarding to Swift a year ago about uh, representing Swift uh, charts and <laughs> charts. It's a good to analyze how we can represent animation by vibrations and music or sound. Good topic to research and make a little bit more yeah. interesting application for voiceover users. Yeah, that's that's a great point. Yeah. That's something we didn't investigate yet, but we definitely should. More questions.